No slides tonight. I'm going to do this old school. I wrote a few Bible verses up there. Those are, going to, those are the verses I'm going to reference while we're talking about this. That is not an exhaustive list of all of the verses we could have looked at, but we'd be here till midnight if I put all of them up there. So that's a sampling. Those are the best ones too, I think. So you guys got presented with the creed. The Nicene Creed, right? Okay. Well, a good question to ask would be, what's up with the creed? What, I mean, wh why do we have this thing that we make such a big deal out of giving it to you? What's the, what's the story? Well, <clears throat> first an apology. When I gave this talk last year, we did not do a church history talk. So I talked a lot about church history in this talk because it's all wrapped up in where the creed came from and all that kind of stuff. Well, this afternoon, I glanced at the church history talk and realized, oh no, I said a bunch of the same stuff <laughs> I said in this talk last year. So I'm, I'm going to try not to repeat myself. So if I start into something and you're like, you talked about that before, just shut me down and tell me to just move on. Um, but I, I will probably repeat a few things. So... Creeds originally, you have to put yourself back in the early church, okay? This is first and second century. This is the time when it's a little dangerous to think about joining the church because Christianity is not legal at this point. So people might approach you as a Christian and say, hey, I've read about your movement and I think I want to become a part of that. That could have been a spy. You, you just don't know, but you, don't, you want to give him the benefit of the doubt. And so you put him in the catechumenate. You train him. You teach him about Scripture and the church and what the church teaches. And a good summary when they get close to being baptized is to give them a copy of what you believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty. You give him a copy of the creed. That gives, but you wait till the very end to give them that. Now, when I say give him a copy, I don't mean a written copy. A lot of the early church fathers harped on this a lot, especially during this time of, of persecution. They wrote a lot about the creed, but one of the main things they wrote was, don't ever write this down. St. Ambrose, my patron saint, said, the only place you write that creed down is on your heart. This is the reason we don't have very many copies of those older creeds. They didn't write them down. They memorized them. Of course, it's you know, 2,000 years ago too, so that's part of the reason we don't have any. But they didn't write this stuff down. They would memorize it because you didn't want it to fall into the wrong hands and get traced back to you and your, your friends at your church. So most of the creeds, as I said, were leading up to baptism. So you would profess this creed right before they baptized you. And that's kind of how you would let them know that you're legit. We can tell you all the other stuff now, now that you're baptized. They didn't talk a lot about the Eucharist to people before they baptized them because that's letting the secrets out and you may wind up staring down the barrel of a bunch of Roman soldiers if you tell the wrong person about what you're doing. So creeds are often also referred to as it's a symbol this little set of sayings that I'm going to tell to you is a symbol of my faith and symbols back then meant something a little different than they mean now there's a Greek term it's, it's a symbolon and it was a way for people to identify an association they had with one another and part of that was economic. The example I use is you would be going to go on a, on a trip and you needed to leave your valuables someplace safe. And so you would take your money or whatever the valuable thing was, you would take it to a store or to the facsimile they would have of a bank. And you would give this person your valuable and you would come back and get that when you got back from your trip. Well, how was he going to know? Because you might be gone for years. 
How's he going to know that's your stuff? You would take this medallion, and I, I'm not an artist, people, so just cut me some slack. You would give this clay medallion, this is a flat piece of clay that would have carvings on it. And you would take that and you would break it in half. So you would have jagged edges on both sides. The keeper of your property would keep a half of it and you would keep a half of it. And when you came back five years later and you went to get your stuff, you would pull out your half and he would take his half and if they matched, he knows this is your property. So the creed is a symbol that two Christians can kind of walk up to each other and kind of whisper it to one another and they would know, okay, this guy, we're, we're okay. We're not in any kind of danger. So, <clears throat> remember we, um, we talked about Constantine in the church history thing, how he's kind of a, he gets talked bad a lot about in this day and age, but he's really a hero of the church. If y'all remember, he's the person that made Christianity legal. In A.D. 313, he published the Edict of Milan, or the Edict of Tolerance, making all religions legal. Not just Christianity, he said, you have to leave everybody alone. Let them worship how they want to worship. Well, Christianity is legal now, so it grows like crazy. And coming up to 313 was the persecution of a character called Diocletian, I may have mentioned him in the history talk. That was the worst one. That, if that had kept going, mathematically speaking, Christianity could have almost been wiped out because they were really serious about it. Well, Constantine shuts that down, <clears throat> and there's the few Christians that are left grow the church between 313 and 325. The church grows to the point where 25% of the Roman population is Christian. That's a lot in that short a time. But when a movement, a religious movement, grows that fast, other things grow with it. Those are called heresies. People kind of start going off on their own and saying, well, I don't think the church is right about this. I think this is the truth. And they'll collect a little following with them if they're fairly charismatic. Remember we talked about Arius back in the history course. Arius, the priest from Alexandria, Egypt, started this movement where he decided that, I I don't think Jesus is really God. He's not just a man, but he's not really God. And I I stole this this drawing from somebody to kind of explain what, what Arius was. It's pretty simple. Everything above this line is deity. Everything below this line is a creature created, right? So what goes up here? Just one thing. That's the only thing above the line. Everything else is down here. All creatures, everything created, everything that had a beginning goes down here. Jesus, according to Arius, is right there. He's still a creature. He's on the bottom of the line. So he had a beginning. There was a time when he was not. But he was higher than the rest of the creatures. And this this is the heresy of Arianism, which, with a charismatic leader, spreads like wildfire. It gets so bad that more than half of the church, quote unquote, becomes Arian. Half the bishops, more than half the bishops or Arian at one point. So needless to say, this is a big brouhaha. Lots of fights, lots of unrest, we might say. And the Roman emperors, all of them had one thing in common. They didn't like unrest. They liked peaceful times. I don't want to send my army in there. A lot of people are going to get killed. I'm going to lose a lot of soldiers. It's expensive. So everybody make nice. Constantine got word that this Arian business was in the church and making a mess. So he contacts the Pope and says, 
you need to tell your boy down in Alexandria to calm down. Meaning the bishop of Arius, not Arius. So the Pope sends word to the bishop, and the bishop tries to squash Arius and tell him you need to stand down and stop spreading this stuff. <clears throat> well, Arius had quite an ego, and he ignored him and kept spreading the word. Like I said, he was very charismatic, so he had a lot of followers, and so there was no peace. And so Constantine, the emperor, called the Council of Nicaea. He wanted all the bishops of the world who could make the trip to be there. And 289 of them showed up. And they came up with that creed that you're looking at, that they gave you. So a lot of that stuff in there is directly associated with the Arian heresy, trying to ferret out what it is we exactly believe about who Jesus is. <clears throat> so, that's enough about Constantine and Arius. I want to go through the creed with you guys line by line and let's try to look at what it means and what, what in Scripture backs it up. I come from a background where we didn't say the creed. Heck, I didn't know, what, I didn't know there was a creed until I got to college. That's the first time I ever saw anything like that. And the reason... My low church Protestant denomination didn't say the creed is because it's, there's no creed in the Bible. Really? Okay, well, well, we'll see about that. Okay. We'll start at the very beginning. <clears throat> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. The Apostles' Creed starts off different. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Why did we add that word one? Well, the Apostles' Creed is an earlier creed. In the early church, who were all the converts? They were Jews. That's who started this thing out. And what were Jews? Jews were monotheists. So the idea of there being one God was not a problem for them. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That was right there in the law, right there in the Torah. So you didn't need to convince the Jews there was one God. The Nicene Creed comes out in the 4th century. And who are most of the converts then? Roman pagans. And pagans are polytheists. So this concept of there being one God needs to be sort of stamped on your creed, stamped on your symbol. Because <clears throat> the first time you tell a Roman pagan there's only one God, they're going to call you an atheist. That's what they, they called the Christians, atheists, because they, they only believed in one God. And everybody knows there's a plethora of gods. There's more than we can count. So that's why that word one got put in that line. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Well... Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Let's just go back to the beginning of the book and start there, right? Maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Material things and immaterial things that you can't see. Colossians 1.16. For in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. There is one body, one spirit, and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, 
one baptism. The only begotten Son of God. Hey, it's John 3.16. It's the football Bible verse where they hold up the cardboard thing. and <laughs> John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. My great aunt had me memorize that when I was three years old. I couldn't even read. And that lady was having me memorize scripture verses. I can remember standing in her den when she had me memorize the 23rd Psalm. I loved her. She was awesome. You can hear me doing this too, can't you? Yeah, I know. I know. All right. Now here is a place where it says, this is not in the creed, but it talks about him, him proceeding from the Father. And that's where John, John 8, verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded and came forth from God. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Born of the Father before all ages, before time began. Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's the verse that got Arius going down the wrong road. Born of the Father, the firstborn of all creation. Well, Arius stopped right there. But it says before all ages. That's before time. If there's not time, that means there's no ending. Somebody asked me last year after the class, somebody asked me, what's the difference between being born and being begotten? That's a good question. Because you read all the old books and it says so-and-so begot so-and-so and so-and-so begot so-and-so. And the difference between the Father and the Son is the Son is eternally begotten from the Father. He's always been being begotten and he always will be. It's an eternal thing. It never has a starting and a stopping point. Try to wrap your head around that. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Do you get the sense that they're piling on Arius a little bit? You know, just like pound, pound. <laughs> now, I, I probably said this in the history class. Arius was at the Council of Nicaea. He was there. They let him speak. You remember what happened to him while he was talking? Another bishop got up and did something. St. Nicholas got up and popped him one. He just had all he could, he'd heard all he could hear. He was just done. But yeah, they're really driving home all this God from God, light from light. Now you'll notice all this light talk, light, darkness, all this business. Um, and I use the Gospel of John a lot to talk about the light and the dark and all that kind of stuff. The Gospel of John was thought to be a, a very late rendition. Like there are sort of modern scripture scholars, at least in decades past, who, who made the argument that the Gospel of John wasn't written until the second century, maybe even the third century. So therefore it was not written by St. John. Because it had all this light, dark you know, business in it. And that's a very Greek way of writing. And, and no one in the first century in Palestine wrote that way. Really. Well, then in 1947, they found some pieces of scrolls in a cave outside of a place called Qumran. And they got all those pieces of scrolls and they've translated all of them now. About a quarter of them, 250 of them, are Scripture but 750 or so are simply writings of the community that live there. 
about the way they were to live their lives and the rules that they were going to follow and a lot of, a lot of prophetic talk. And it's just riddled with talk about light and dark, the sons of righteousness and the sons of darkness. All, just all through that, those things were all written in the first century B.C. So they were writing about things like that back then. So now all those people that think John was written in the second century, don't, they don't talk about that anymore. So, back to the light and the darkness. Here's more piling on for Arius. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Consubstantial with the Father. Now there's a $13 word. Consubstantial. What does that mean? Well, literally, it means of the same substance. Uh oh, running out of board. That's a lot of Bible verses. That kind of takes up everything. Homoousios, that's the Greek word for consubstantial. And it just means of the same substance, the exact same substance. I'm throwing a Greek word up there because that's the original language of the Nicene Creed. I should have told you that. It was Greek. It was composed in Greek. So this is, this is the word, one of the words they're arguing about. <clears throat> this is of the same substance. The Arians wanted to use a different word. What's the difference? One letter. But in the Greek alphabet, that I is really called an iota. Ever heard the phrase, there's not one iota of difference between... That's where that, that's where that saying comes from. Homoeusios means of a similar substance. Thus how Jesus is just below that line. He's not God, but he's kind of like God. He's similar to God. That's what the Arians wanted. They wanted to use that. Well, they lost, so they didn't get to use their word. Okay. Through him all things were made. We just read, that's the beginning of the Gospel of John. For us men and for our salvation... For us men. Okay, there's, it's like the, the very beginning where it says one God. They put that word there for a reason. For us men and our salvation. Why'd they have to put that in there? All of these things are kind of dogmatically defining something. Why did they have to say for us men? Remember, it's all about a heresy. There's another heresy. Third century a man named Origen. Origen thought that not only could we be saved, but the demons could repent at the end and be saved. Satan himself could be saved. No Origen for us men and our salvation. Us, us creatures. Why are we so special? The corollary question to that, why are we so special, is why does Satan hate you so much? He does, you know. Why? What what'd we do to him? You're on the right track. God loves us. You just cut my whole argument out from under me. Yeah, that's that. Okay, I'm going to back up a little bit and flesh that out. That is the correct answer. 
We, Satan wanted to be God. That was his flaw. I will ascend and be like the Most High. But there's one thing Satan can't do. He can't create anything. He's just a spirit. All the angels are spirit beings. We are the only creature, the only creation of God that has a rational soul that's an intellect and a free will and a physical body. We're the only one. Satan doesn't have a body. Satan wanted to be God. God creates these souls in these meat suits that you made they get to create. We get to create with God, and that makes Satan furious. So that's why he hates you so much. Scary stuff, huh? <laughs> so that was where that, that particular use of the word men, it's, this is for us. We're special. God made us special. Okay. He came down from heaven. Came down from heaven. Okay. That's not that impressive. But the scripture verse that I picked for this is, this is Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. This paragraph is believed is a Christological hymn. Paul took this from something where they sang this at, at, at church. And he just put that right into the letter of the Philippians. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient, obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a little better than he came down from heaven. That punches it up a little bit. By the Holy Spirit incarnate of the Virgin Mary. That's the Annunciation. That's the first chapter of Luke, right? Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Came down from heaven and became man. More heresies. During the history talk, did we talk about Gnosticism, we talked about that. So y'all remember, Gnostics, the spirit world is good, the physical world is evil. That makes your body evil. So the Gnostic thoughts get into some Christian groups and the idea <clears throat> that the second person of the Trinity, the, the Savior, became a man, got one of these stinky, nasty bodies and crawled into it, they weren't having any of that. And there was a lot of Gnostic thought during the first couple of centuries when the church was forming. And a lot of the, if you read the epistles of John, first, second, and third, he's talking a lot about people who are taking Christians away from the true belief. They're going off on their own with these, these sort of bad people who want to be bishops. And I, I think he's fighting with the Gnostics because of the way he writes about things. It makes you think that he's writing against the Gnostics. A good example of that, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Full of grace and truth, we have beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten Son from the Father. You could just hear him you know, with a Gnostic audit, he became flesh. And just, they would just recoil in horror. 1 John 4, 1 through 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit 
which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you heard that it was coming, and now it is in the world already. Crucified under Pontius Pilate. Now, we're rolling along talking about all these lofty theological things, trying to figure out what that word means and what, where are they trying to get at. And all of a sudden, they drop a rock right in the middle of our party with a historical figure. It's like, boom, Pontius Pilate is in our creed? I don't think he was a very good guy. Why is he in our creed? Well, they insisted that they were going to give this story historical context. This is real. This is true. This happened. And here's a guy who was actually there while all this was going on. So that gives it an anchor in history. <clears throat> this really happened. But as the centuries go by, some scholars start to argue that Pontius Pilate was kind of a mythical character because there's absolutely no physical proof that he ever existed. And that was kind of a hot thing going for a long time, up into, into the 20th century. Until 1961, in a town in Palestine called Caesarea Maritima, there's lots of Caesareas in the old world, Caesarea Philippi is up in the north. Caesarea Maritima is over on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And they found a tablet that had Pontius Pilate's name carved in it from that time. That happened in 1961. And all of the talk about Pilate not being a real person kind of you know, went away. So. The most recent proof is that Pilate apparently had coins minted while he was in Judea. Around AD 29. And the place where we found those coins were on the Shroud of Turin. Everybody knows what the Shroud of Turin is? The purported burial cloak of the Lord well, as computers and cameras and high-definition video and all this stuff has advanced over the years, they've been able to take better pictures of the shroud when the people that keep the shroud will let them do that. And these high-resolution pictures, somebody was looking at the eyes, and the eyes had bulges on them, like there was something over the eyes. And looking at those high-resolution photographs, they realized those are coins, and they have engraving on them. And part of Pilate's name is, is on there. Which puts the cloth back when Pilate was the governor of Judea. That piece of evidence right there is what pushed me over the edge. I, I now accept that the Turin Shroud is the burial cloth of Jesus. That, I was like, okay. that's. I got that from a, a video by a, a priest named Father Robert Spitzer. He's on EWTN a lot. He runs an organization called the Magus Center, and it's about philosoph philosophical stuff and science. He's a scientific genius, and he can do lectures. He's got a lecture about the shroud that's really, really good, and you can find it on YouTube. It's really, it's really awesome. Okay. He suffered death and was buried. That's more of a finger in the eye to the Gnostics. You know, he suffered death and we buried him. He's the Lord, but we buried him. And rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven. The book of Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven 
will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. Upholding the universe by his word of power. When he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This phrase really struck me in the middle of that verse. Upholding the universe by his word of power. God holds us in existence. He's constantly creating. He, he keeps us here. I heard, I heard somebody say on a video I was watching once, like if God stopped thinking about you, you would disappear. In fact, all the evidence of the existence of you would be gone. Possibly including the memory of the people that knew you. That's deep stuff. That's just way, whew, that's way down there. Okay. He will come in to judge the living and the dead. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. 1 Peter 4, 4 through 6. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to the dead, that though judged in the flesh like men, they might live in the spirit like God. The gospel was preached to the dead. Hmm. Is there something in one of the creeds about that? Not the one you got tonight, not the Nicene. In the Apostles' Creed, it says, He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Now, a lot of people read that and think, Oh, he went to hell where all the damned people are. No, that didn't exist yet. That, the, the word hell there is a very poor translation of the word Hades. The place of the dead is where... In the Old Testament, they called it Sheol. In the New Testament, Jesus called it um, the bosom of the fathers, Father Abraham. Remember the story about Lazarus and the rich man? and Lazarus, was, was died, Lazarus died and he went to be with Abraham in, in a place of, of relative happiness because he didn't do anything bad. The rich man was down in the tormenting place. Jesus went to the bosom of the fathers to preach the gospel to the righteous dead. After he died on the cross, that's where he went. And he took those people out of that Sheol and brought them to heaven. And then he rose from the dead. So that's what he was doing while his body was in that tomb. Now, when we get to the part about, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the fire, we just change cities. We're not in Nicaea anymore, Dorothy. We're moved up to Constantinople, and we've gone several decades into the future. The Nicene Creed, in reference to the Holy Spirit, says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, period. It stops right there. They fleshed it out more at the Council of Constantinople because questions came up about what do we do with the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit God? Constantinople attached the rest of the wording. Now the Bible verses I put up there are from Genesis, again. The earth was, was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Well, there's the Holy Spirit. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. What's that got to do with the Holy Spirit? With breath. The Greek word 
And the Septuagint is? That's the Hebrew word. Pneuma. It means breath. And the Spirit is referred to as the breath of God. Brah, that's really good. <laughs> I took it a Holy Spirit Bible study with the church guys. Nice. <laughs> <clears throat> Proceeds from the Father and the Son. John 15, 26. But when the Counselor comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. The Holy Spirit is adored and glorified. He's God, so he's worshipped. He's adored. Spoken through the prophets. All the Old Testament prophets and John the Baptist. They proclaim the word of the Lord. Where did they get that word? The Holy Spirit. Now we're here to the four marks of the church. One holy Catholic apostolic. One. John 17, 20 through 21. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Holy. Well, the church is the body of Christ, and Christ is holy, so that's kind of, don't really need a Bible verse for that. Catholic. Mm. The first time that word is known to be written down or at least the, the only document we have with that word, katholikos, that's the Greek for universal, is in one of the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch at the very beginning of the second century. Ignatius was, he was the bishop of Antioch, and he was on his way, escorted by some of his um, Roman friends, for a date with the lions in the Colosseum in Rome, and while he was on his way, he was writing letters to different churches. And one of them he refers to the Catholic Church. Ecclesia Catholicos. So that's the first place you'll see that written. Doesn't mean it wasn't written before, it's just what we have. 1 Corinthians 1.10 I appeal to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no dissensions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And on to verse 15. If anyone is disposed to be contentious, we recognize no other practice, nor do the churches of God. So there's Paul hammering on that one thing. We're one. We stay together. Apostolic. Jude verse 3. Beloved, being very eager to write to you of our common salvation, I find it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And in 2 Thessalonians, then, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. One baptism for the forgiveness of sins. That's back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So that's the same, same verse. The resurrection of the dead. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. John 5, 28, 29. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And the life of the world to come. This is where we get to the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation chapter 21. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, like I said, that's a bunch of Bible verses, but that's not an exhaustive list. In fact, the phrase in, in the first chapter of Hebrews about he went up and sat down at the right hand of the Father, that's one verse that references that. How many other verses in the Bible reference him sitting down at the right hand of the Father? Old and New Testament. 99. There's a hundred verses that talk about that sitting at the right hand of the Father. So that's a really important phrase, apparently. But anyway, that was a long slog through the creed. Anybody have any questions about anything? Everybody looks tired. <laughs> it's dark and cold outside. Ma'am? Why do we... Why do we say it every single Mass? Well, that's a good question. Because it's part of the liturgy, that's the cop-out answer. The <laughs> church tells us to, so that's why we do it. But, in the Protestant world, you will often find someone recommitting their life to Jesus. This is after they've been saved, they're baptized, but they go up at the altar call and they, they reprofess their faith. We do it every Sunday. I think it's to keep us in, to be mindful of what we believe because we say it every single Mass. So you can't plead ignorance. Now I remember... When my wife was sitting, we were sitting in here just like you guys are, and we'd been going to Mass and <clears throat> looking in the front of the hymnal and reading the Creed. And, and I know we're already in Lent, but my wife had this idea. She said, for Lent, let's memorize the Creed so we can just say it like those people in there and don't have to look down at the book. And so I figured out that each line in the Creed would correspond to almost how many days are in Lent and said, oh, we're going to do one, memorize one line every day and then start at the beginning that day and just add that line and go through it and by the time we got to the end of Lent we had both memorized the creed so if you want to do that that's, that's a good Lent thing to do I think but, yeah you're going to have to double up <laughs> anybody else sir Because it's, it's meant in the general universal term. It's not a capital C Catholic. It's the Catholicos. It means the universal church. And that includes not just us, but that includes all validly baptized Christians. So it's everybody. They are in a... This is going to get into some deep stuff, but I'm going to try not to. Um, all that validly baptized Christians whether they are card carrying members of the Catholic Church or not are still in communion with us but in an imperfect way that's the, that's the language they use but they are still connected to us by their baptism so we're referring to them too when we talk about the universal church Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Mr. Tolkien, anything? <laughs> well, thank y'all. Have a good night. Have a good spring break. I don't know if y'all are going to travel or anything like that.